Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, here I represent uh, three different entities, so MIT Mathematics, uh, the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, and the AI Accelerator. So this is a very nice project kind of right at the middle between all of these different groups. And on the next slide, what I, what I really want to show is that um, so getting accurate data is hard and expensive, right? So there's two things that people are really looking at right now to be able to solve this COVID crisis, right? One is widespread testing, right? If you can test everyone, then you can make good decisions. The other thing that you can do is you can test some people and then you can trace who they've been in contact with and use that to be able to find out who's probably going to get infected as well, right? So the interesting things about these techniques is that they can tell you exactly who is infected. And if you know exactly who's infected, then of course you can you know, isolate them and come up with the proper techniques. And if you know everybody who's infected, you also have a good count for the number of infected individuals. But this is expensive, right? This is infeasible. So even though there are some people in the government who are saying that everyone who wants a test can get a test, um, that doesn't turn out to be true, right? And other things that uh, are also starting to come up about this, right? So contact tracing is very biased towards those who have been able to already get tests, right? So people who are in uh, groups that tend to have access to healthcare tend to be the ones who are able to make better use of contact tracing. But that means that uh, there are certain age groups or certain ethnicity groups, which really, which will benefit more from these. So what, we're in, what I was trying to look at instead was, are there population level statistics that we can gather without getting such fine grained expensive data? So in my next slide, really what I start to ask is, can we, ex uh, can we extract meaningful population level information from cheaper data sources? So can we uh, skip ahead to the next slides? And then the next one. So what I wanna do is I wanna take a, a example from probability and I wanna flip it on its head a little bit. So a lot of people here probably know about the base rate fallacy, right? So if you have around 2.4% of women who have breast cancer, if you have a test that has a sensitivity of catching breast cancer, which is 87%, and a false positive rate of 12%, well, you can actually go through and say, well, if I had 10,000 individuals, then with a 2.4% rate, then I'd have 238 with cancer, 9,700 uh, 9, without cancer. And what you end up with is, it turns out that with these statistics, you know, your, your test is about 87% sensitive, only has a false positive rate of 12%. You still only have a 15% chance of having cancer if that test says you're positive, right? So this is known as the base rate fallacy. And it basically says that, you know, in diseases, which are things that have a low percentage of being, showing up throughout the population, um, having something that isn't an absurdly high test of uh, positive rate, all right, ha without having very good tests, you tend to get very, very many false positives. And so for, the, for this reason, a lot of people are saying, oh, you know, these, a lot of these tests for COVID-19 are essentially useless because you, they can't really tell you if someone has the disease. But let's change the question, right? The qu what we really want to understand with, with a epidemic is how are things changing in aggregate? And if you know the sensitivity and you know the false positive rate, can you estimate the, the rate of the disease? And it turns out you can, right? Because this starts coming back to the law of large numbers. If you know the percentage of people who are gonna be a false positive and a false negative, you can use that to extract back, run this problem backwards and figure out, oh, this percentage of the population probably has the disease. And that is what we're, that is kind of, this is the general idea of all these different studies I'm gonna be talking about where even if a test is not able to tell you who's infected, it can still tell you what number of people are infected and how that is changing over time. And so you can make cheap and useless tests still useful. So in my next slide, I start going into one of the, uh, let's, I wanna start talking about how we can take this idea into reality with some real case studies here. So the next slide is a, one of the case studies we've been looking at, which is this coexist project that we've been doing with the Alan Turing Institute. And what we've been showing is that if we were to do on a mass scale, um, cheap, but in, cheap, ineffective, you know, in quotes, testing across the United Kingdom, could we come up with a strategy to be able to do localized lockdowns? So instead of requiring that the entire country goes under lockdown, maybe do lockdowns that are specific to certain areas more given what we're seeing from these weak tests. And what we of the tests themselves, as long as the tests are reasonably accurate. 
you know, like 60% uh, maximum sensitivity. We can still get enough data if we just do mass amounts of testing. And what really matters is the number of people that we test, right? If we test a lot of people with bad tests, we can still get good aggregate information to be able to know which areas are the, are the strong points and where the infection is taking hold and use that to be able to get good policy information. And so this is what we're building out with the, with the help of Microsoft and, and GitHub for building a, um, a policy facing uh, interface. So that way we can support the usage of a large scale amount of tests, which is, and this will work independent of whether the tests are actually sensitive. Um, and the next project that we're looking at uh, on the next slide is what we call safe blues. So in this idea, um, what we're doing is we are building a Bluetooth protocol, which will essentially simulate how viruses are interacting with each other. So it's you can almost think about it like contact tracing, but it's doing something different, right? So if, two, if one person has strand one and your cell phone comes in close into contact with someone else, then there's a random chance that you can give them strand one, right? If they have strand two, there's a random chance that they can give you strand two. Those random chances can be different depending on the strand. And so what we can do is we can, we can simulate, you know, 50, 60, 100 rand, uh, of these fake diseases going through people's cell phones at a time. And what these do is they serve as a proxy for your social structures and your quarantine effects, right? So what we, what we can basically, so these ideas of like, oh, here's one person who's in one area, goes to another place and becomes a super spreader. This is essentially simulated by this person getting, you know, unique strands and going to a new area or a new social network and giving these uh, networks new strands, right? And so these spreads, these strands are spreading up with contact just like the real disease. And so they can be a proxy for how the real disease is working and how well the quarantine is, is taking hold. So on the next slide, what we demonstrate is that using this kind of information, so using, a fake, uh, using fake diseases that are propagated in a way that is almost similar to the real disease, we can have many different strands running at the same time. So each of those light blue lines is a different, say, blue strand. What we can do is we can train neural networks to be able to learn the correlation between safe blue strands and the real disease, right? Because some safe blue strands will have a higher chance of infecting people on contact, others will have a low chance. And from a combination of these safe blue strands, we can understand what, what is the way to be able to construct something that works like the real disease. And so what we did here is we trained the neural networks up to day 100. And then we asked the question, given the safe blues information that we've now trained up to day 100, can we extrapolate out to the future and understand on a given day what, how the infection statistics are going? And the reason why this is interesting is because the real statistics that we have lag by about two weeks, right? They, they get, we get some weird numbers and then they kind of get updated over time. You don't really get correct statistics about what happens until two weeks after uh, the, the day that you're looking at. So what the safe blues can do is it can allow you to be able to train using your prior information. And then now you have a real time series, right? You have these real time uh, fake diseases spreading through your cell phone, which are correlated with the real disease and will tell you in real time, hey, there's a second wave that's starting. So for a lot of people, we probably want to be looking at that information right now. Um, so it's not going to be able to detect the second wave because I believe that it's already started. Um, but maybe this is something that we can make use of in future epidemics. On the next slide, what we show is that we can also mix this with scientific machine learning. So we can say we have uh, simple models like SIRs or SEIRs. You know, they can, they're also graph-based. There are many different things that we can do to this. But we can train these models where the, the what are usually kept as constants of the model are actually determined by uh, policy. So we can measure uh, things happening in the real world. We can come up with policy scores. We can then relate these policy scores to the model. And we can train those policy scores, those BFPs, as missing functions and learn what they what those missing art functions are through the scientific machine learning techniques. Right? So those are neural networks embedded into the differential equations, which we then train. And once we've trained that, we can come up with a way of relating our policy scores back to the model and then understand a mapping between here's the policy and here's the R effective that we have or the R0 um, that is related with this policy choice. And we can use this to understand how in different regions of the world, um, how, how, what kinds of policies are required in order to hit a real R0. And so um, the interesting thing about these approaches that we mentioned is that in the next slide that really what this shows is that we can 
you know, everyone is wondering, like, how can we get data that is good enough to be able to, you know, handle this disease at mass? And what these kinds of ideas are showing is that we can use cheap data effectively, right? We can use cheap data to get large, uh, to get good aggregate information. And then the problem really just turns into how do you do real-time scientific machine learning estimation on things that are heavily correlated with the real disease process? Um, and so for this, in my next slide, what, what, I introduce, what we're introducing is we have this collaboration that is going between Microsoft, uh, GitHub, and the Julia Lab, specifically the scientific machine learning uh, group, uh, where what we're doing is we're, we're uh, building out these, these real-time real estimation tools and deploying them in ways such that the UK and Australian governments have access to this real-time information. Um, those are the those are the basically governments that we have gotten access to so far and have been able to uh, uh, get in contact with policymakers. Um, maybe through the AI accelerator, we can find a way to you know help the U.S. as well. What we've done so far is we've used these uh, Julia tools. So so first of all, when when this project started, we were looking at how we can come up with the how solve the problem of uh, these simulations can take time. How do you make it so that way a real time estimator can actually run in real time? And the first thing that we did was we, uh, we rewrote the models from Julia, uh, Python to Julia and then used the Julia differential equation solvers. And that actually accelerated the model by 36,000 times. And so, we, uh, so what was originally something that required cloud computation now was perfectly fine on one node to be able to run in real time. Um, and this utilized some automated parallelization for dynamic scheduling. And so it really came down to, to solving a, com a computer problem now which we can, uh, we, which we were able to just accelerate using our uh, tools. So on the next slide, um, th this is something that, we're, that has been happening in other aspects. So I'm not going to go into detail because this has been more about epidemiology, but another aspect of, of the scientific machine learning group in the Julia lab is we've been looking at accelerated uh, numerical integration techniques that we've been working with internal cardiac mo models with the, the Pfizer quantitative systems pharmacology group and when they tr were able to translate their models over to these uh, new integration techniques, they saw an eight times to 170x times acceleration over their heavily optimized C code. And what this means is that the very slow steps of the clinical trial process um, have been able to be accelerated because the, essentially the, the clinical trials have fixed times that they're actually doing the data collection. And so the only parts that you can, that you can shrink and actually make faster are these analysis parts in the middle, these quantitative systems pharmacology group parts. So um, a lot of the details about where this is being used is still behind NDAs, but essentially the, what, I, what I can mention is that there are um, vaccines being built by this the software that we put out, this FDA compliant uh, software which it, with, a, with a full startup now behind it um, called Pumas. And there are vaccine trials being worked on with mRNA vaccines. And if you know the groups in Cambridge, then you probably know which companies are that's associated with. If you want more information on exactly how we did these uh, these accelerations, um, it's going to be talked about in more detail in JuliaCon 2020. I have a talk lined up called Automatic, uh, Auto Optimization and Parallels on parallelism in differentialequations.jl, which will talk about how all of these different models were automatically parallelized for the user and how their models were automatically recompiled to GPUs. Um, so in conclusion on the next slide, I, I think that the, the main idea here is that we should really look beyond these techniques like contact tracing or you know, mass amounts of expensive testing because there's a lot of other information we can get. Right. We can use cheap testing to be able to do things like calibrate these, you know, safe blue strands or these these fake viruses being sent around Bluetooth. And then if we have these these pieces that are correlated with the real virus, we can use that to be able to come up with effective policymaking without going through the expense of, of accurately finding out every single person who's infected. Um, all that this really uh, comes down to in the end, then, is we need to be able to run these accurate simulations and accurate inference tools at at a speed to be able to come at a speed to be able to do real time estimation, and that is being provided by the new scientific machine learning stack that we're providing in Julia. So you can get more information about the SciML stack, this new open source software organization, by going to SciML.ai. And yeah, thank you very much.